And what's good, we aren't really paying attention enough to know what we're running to and from. We're just running. Well, when we think and pray and discern and, and wonder, we figure out that may be a little closer to the good side than, than the evil side. And maybe that's the way I'm called to go. I'm sometimes surprised at the things that I hear now as a parent that I didn't hear before when I was a parent. <laughs> like Peanuts specials, those television specials based on the cartoon. I never heard how mean those children were until I started <laughs> listening as a parent. They are some mean little children. Charles Schultz, Minions Drew. I, I'm just amazed at what they'll say to each other. And, and I'm sure the writers are saying, we're just being real. But I want a different reality for my children and how they speak to one another and to others. It, it's a different sort of decision you make when you say, I'm going to seek after what's good and, and avoid what's evil. Now again, most of us won't end up uh, famous fighting the FCC trying to take the peanuts off the air. But if we want that different thing for our children, it gives me pause to wonder if I don't want that difference for me too. You know, what, what decisions about what I seek out and what I seek to avoid if it's enough to offer my children what I not offer for myself. Something to think about. Alright, verse 10. I, I like this one a lot. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. I played fifth fiddle once. That's only because there were five fiddles in that little book. The reason I played fifth fiddle is because I did not practice at all. What Paul's saying here is the opposite. He's saying, give effort to being second fiddle. Work at it. Spend some energy trying to be second fiddle, which is so different than how the world tells us. You're supposed to be the best, the one. And here's Paul saying, sometimes you've got to give some effort to not be the one. And it's not because he wants you to do less than your best. It's because sometimes your best is letting someone else have this attention for a little while. Sometimes we'll, we'll be somewhere and Sally start telling a story and, and I want to correct it. <laughs> Add a little detail here, tell a little thing there, and, and pretty soon I've taken that story from her and it's become my story. And It's never quite as embellished as it would have been if she had just kept telling it. It's never quite as good. <laughs> I, I, I think about it later, and I'm like, I don't want to be the guy who steals his wife's stories. Why, why couldn't I just be second fiddle to him? What, what value was that? You hear it a lot of times when people are trying to empathize with somebody, but they end up taking the fiddle away. Somebody will kind of have a pitch in their step, and the person will say, um, you okay? What's wrong? Well, I hurt my knee the other day. Oh, oh I'm sorry. They tell a little bit about it, and the person oh, that's okay, you should see the bolts in my knee. <laughs> you know, they immediately take away that story, and they one up them. They, they've had the more impressive, painful life experience than the other person. Not letting that person just share what's, what's going on in their life. They, they rip that fiddle right out of the hand of the other person. Practice playing second fiddle. It's so basic, so just normal. How do we live? You don't have to be Christian to say it's important. Sometimes let somebody else tell a story about themselves, but... But these are kind of like Paul saying, okay, if all that's true, if you're going to offer yourself to God, if you're going to say, here, take my everyday, ordinary life, then you've got to think about just the things you say and how they say it. You say it, those things also matter in what it means to be somebody who follows Jesus Christ. All right, it sounds like a lot, right? Getting weary just hearing it all. So Paul is aware of that. Don't burn out, he says in verse 11. Keep yourselves fueled in a flame. Be alert, servants of the Master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Sounds like something your coach would say to you, right, Brian? Don't quit. Pray harder. Keep going. It's coach language. This is the way coaches talk. He's saying, I'm watching you. I'm with you. Keep at it. I think he's aware that we aren't going to get all this right the first time we try. I, you probably know who like to exercise. And when I was... In seminary, Sai and I started running together. She had been a runner for a long time. So we started running. We started at three miles, which I thought was forever. <laughs> like, 
Do we really need to run three miles? She's like, well, that's not enough. So we start running, and three miles seems like a long time. And pretty soon that gets comfortable. And I decide it's time to add a quarter mile. And I do. And then I add another quarter mile a few months later, and, and now I don't think it's enough if I'm not running seven miles or something. And, and you know, it's American. <laughs> Face drop. <laughs> but but that you know that's that, I think that's the point. If nobody starts out by never having run and saying today I'm going to run a marathon. You shouldn't exactly. I mean I, I think Paul would say, all right, here are the 15 things you have to do today if you're going to be a Christian. Get it right. <laughs> Paul might. <laughs> I think he knows us well enough that we're not going to get it right. But I, but I think he would say in this coach speak, don't quit, pray harder, pick out some things. I mean, who of us has lately planned action in our life? We plan for everything else. Who of us has said, this is an area where I am not following Christ the way I want to? I'm going to put in some steps to adjust. I'm going to do some things. If I were trying to run a little farther, I would figure out. All right, when do I want to add a quarter mile to my run, and where is that quarter mile going to be? We'll do that for running. We won't do that for following Jesus. Don't quit. Pray harder. Figure out a path that, that might get us a little bit closer to what I was talking to Georgia about. Looking a little bit more like Jesus. Maybe it'll look like this. Verse 13. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. We don't have time today to go through all this. But here's the deal I want to make with you. If you haven't yet and want to, sign up for my email list. We're going to go through those little phrases. And on a daily basis, sort of sort out what it means. I think it would be so helpful to me if at the beginning of my day I read, find beauty in everyone. And then I went to work. And, and supposing somebody wasn't looking beautiful to me that day, I thought, find beauty in, in everyone. <laughs> That would happen in our office, Mary. Don't worry. Then <laughs> somebody would come in. Uh, <laughs> I'm not on Monday morning. <laughs> uh, so, you know, what if, if we said today's goal, today my plan is to, to try to, to find beauty. If somebody can be that amazingly good at being annoying, what else can they do that's really good? Yeah, how, how are we going to try to adjust our lives in ways that, that live that thing out. So, so sign up and we'll kind of work through that one together. Alright, last part. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, God says. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. If he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Again, there's so much in there, but the one that stuck out to me was this idea of your enemy becoming a person. If your enemy is hungry, he says, go buy that person something to drink, something to eat. I have a friend who was in the army. He was telling me a story of targets. And he said that, that when they first put up targets for target practice, they were just round circles, you know, kind of like uh, dark boards. Well, some soldiers were learning to shoot those dark boards real good, but when they looked at a person and they had a hard time being desensitized enough to shoot the person. So they evolved and they got into the cutouts of people. They got more and more lifelike. But recently they've realized they don't have to 
worry about desensitizing soldiers. When you've grown up shooting extremely lifelike figures on screens, you don't have to be desensitized. But the, now the challenge is to help the soldiers see the enemy also as a person. Fortunately, many of us, most of us, aren't toting guns to deal with our enemies. But we're still, I think, not seeing them as a person. I mean, mo most of us, if we have that enemy somewhere, how we have that enemy is, is to avoid them and to see them solely as the person who did that. Or, even less human, that enemy. What I think he's pushing us to do is say that is a person who that's part of our story, but that's not all that is to them. I mean, thank God that Jesus doesn't look at us and say, there's sinner. He looks at us and says, there's a child. I love him. He sinned. He did some good things. There's my child. I love him. That's Jesus' daily offering of himself. It's every day offering of himself to God. If that's his, I've got to ask, what's mine? It's yours. Let's pray. Lord, your grace is such that, that you don't look at us and see sinner. You look at us and see child who has sinned and child who has done well, the first child of yours. Your grace is such that you see in us opportunity to help your kingdom, to, to do things that matter, to give our lives in ways that will bring about your, your will on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, help us to receive that call to, to offer up to you in thanksgiving for the grace you poured into our lives, ourselves, our whole selves, all that we are, to just lay them before you and say, do with these as you will. It's the everyday, Lord, we, we recognize the everyday that makes such a difference, that matters so much. Lord, this week, Katie Brock will begin ministry in a new place. So we pray your blessing on her and the people she ministers with there. We thank you for the people in this congregation who have shown her in everyday ways their support and love. We thank you, Lord, that there are Christians seek reaching out right now to persons in, in areas that have been hit hard by the storm, saying, because of Jesus, we love you in these very ordinary ways. Here's a bottle of water. Here's a blanket. We pray for those who are still enduring the storm, still at risk, still anxious. Lord, we pray that in this world that seems to always be bent on violence and war, that somehow you'll work Miracles in Libya and Syria, places where the people are, are trying to make things better, where others resist that. Bring peace and prosperity to broken places. <clears throat> Lord, work your will among us. Make us people who follow you in all that we are. People who pray with earnestness. The prayer of our lives. The prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not 